Howdy, 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 my name is Anashi Sasuke. Welcome back to Let's Read About Cryptids, or whatever I'm going to call these. So in the last episode, I cut off at Mothman because I got part way into it, and then my body was like, hey, you're done being alive now, and I, I blacked out. Apologies. I already apologized in the video where that happened, but I have to apologize again because this, I believe, is a completely different article than the one I was reading last time, because I don't know what the one I was reading last time was. So this one, the story of the Mothman, the legendary creature that terrorized a West Virginia town in the 1960s. Would it be funny if this is exactly the same one as last time and I'm just stupid? It might be. It, it might be. Hold on. Let me check. It might be. No, it's not. I don't remember that picture. Uh, let's just start at the beginning. So... Okay. Separating the fact from fiction behind the Mothman of Point Pleasant, perhaps the creepiest folk legend in American history. Ah. Eh, anyway. On November the 12th in 1966 in Clendenin, West Virginia, a grave digger working in a cemetery spotted something strange. He spotted the New Jersey DMV! Dear God! Um... He glanced up from his work when something huge soared over his head, a massive figure that was moving rapidly across the cemetery from tree to tree. He would later describe the figure as a brown human being. That's racist. This was the first reported sighting of what would come to be known as the Mothman, an elusive creature that, although now widely celebrated by the town it once terrorized, remains as mysterious as it was on the night that a few frightened witnesses first laid eyes on it. I think this is the article that I was reading last time. Because first we checked the Mothman Museum, I feel like this was the last thing I read before I was like, <gasps> I'm not alive anymore. <clears throat> the legend of the Mothman of Point Pleasant is born. The small town of Point Pleasant in West Virginia along the bank of Ohio River, oh I guess that's just describing the picture, is pretty. But it also just drives home the point that Ohio is not where I think it is. You, you want to lay off with the DMV thing? I'll renew my license when I'm good and ready. Get out of here advertisements just three days after the gravedigger's initial report and nearby point pleasant west virginia two couples noticed a gray winged creature about six or seven feet tall standing in front of the car they were all seated in how many dangers two couples eyewitnesses roger scarberry and steven steve mallet told the local paper the point pleasant register that the beast had bright red eyes about six inches apart a wingspan of ten feet and that it seemed to want to avoid the bright headlights of the car that's not how moths work that's the opposite of what moths do when they see light they go lamp get out of here no thank according to the witnesses the creature was able to fly at incredible speeds perhaps as much as 100 miles per hour one of the men told reporters although all agreed it did make for a clumsy runner on the ground they knew because the creature allegedly chased their moving vehicle to the outskirts of town in the air then scuttled into a nearby field and disappeared oh that's creepy looking uh, well, it's 33 of the world's most disturbing museum artifacts, so I'd be shocked if it wasn't. Let it, nope. Knowing how absurd this must have sounded to a local paper in a small Appalachian uh, community in the 1960s, or is it Appalachian? Appalachia? I don't know. Scarberry insisted that the apparition couldn't have been a figment of his imagination. There were three other people. Why would he have made that up? He assured the paper, if I had seen it w while by myself, I wouldn't have said anything, but there were four of us who saw it. See? He know. More Mothman sightings reported over time. I hope that's not what his wings actually look like, because those don't look like 100 mile per hour wings right there. Here's a statue of the Mothman in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. My wallet is fine, thank you very much. The papers at this point were skeptically calling it a bird and a mysterious creature, though they did print Mal's description it was like a man with wings! But more and more sightings were reported in the Point Pleasant area over the next year as the legend of the Mothman took shape. The Gettysburg Times reported eight individual sightings in the short span of three days following the first claims, including two volunteer firefighters who supposedly saw what they described as a very large bird with large red eyes. One sighting reported in Salem, West Virginia, resident Newell Partridge told of strange patterns that appeared on his television screen one evening, followed by a mysterious sound just outside of his home. I've not heard of Mothman being able to mess with TVs. It doesn't really come up very often. 
shining a flashlight towards the direction of the noise, Partridge supposedly witnessed two red eyes, resembling bicycle reflectors looking back at him. Those dang voy voyeur b bicycles? I almost said motorcycles? I don't know what word I almost said instead of voyeur, though. It feels like I tried to say voyage, but like porridge? This anecdote remains a popular one in the Mothman mythos, especially because it resulted in the disappearances of Partridge Dog, supposedly to the clutches of the fearsome beast. A simple explanation? That is no, no. A sandhill crane, a popular explanation among skeptics for the Mothman legend. How is this? How? How do you get people saying it was like a man with wings, and he ran, and he flew, and he scuttled, and bicycle reflectors, and they're like, no, yeah, that's totally this this bird right here. Look how bicycly those eyes are. Absolutely. See, he knows. Dr. Robert L. Smith, Associate Professor of Wildlife Biology at West Virginia University, dismissed the notion that a flying monster was staking out the town, instead attributing the sightings to a sandhill crane, which stands almost as tall as the average adult man and has bright red flesh around its eyes that does not glow. Dr. Smith, you are a fool! The explanation was compelling, given, especially given the number of early reports that had described the creature as bird-like. Wings will do that. I imagine planes are probably bird-like to somebody. Some even hypothesized that the crane was perhaps deformed, especially if it made its home in the TNT area. What locals call a series of nearby bunkers that were used for manufacturing munitions during World War II. It has been suggested that the bunkers have leaked toxic materials into the neighboring wildlife preserve. What? Um... What munitions were they using in World War II that that's a thing they think can just happen? Munitions, to me, makes me think bullets. Like, let's make some shells. What are your bullets made of that you think you have radioactive cranes? Another Point Pleasant legend states that the creation of the Mothman was nothing more than the work of one very committed prankster who went so far as to hide in the abandoned World War II munitions plant where many of the sightings occurred. And he just sort of ran at people at 100 miles per hour and stole dogs. Okay. The laboratory and supervisor's office acid area, part of what the locals now refer to as the TNT area in 1942. Once again, I gotta ask, what were these munitions that they had at acid area that required a supervisor's office? I feel like bullets don't use many of these things. The theory goes that when the national press ran with the Mothman story, spreading it across the country, panic set in, as, as one does. Locals became convinced they were seeing the Mothman in birds and other large animals, even long after the prankster had given up. The Mothman also bears a striking resemblance to several demon archetypes found among those who have experienced sleep paralysis perhaps suggesting that the visions are nothing more than the embodiment of typical human fears, pulled from the depths of the unconscious and grafted onto real-life birds or animal sightings when people panic. That's not how sleep paralysis works. Then there are the paranormal explanations, a morass of complicated theories that weave together aliens, UFOs, and precognition. They paint the Mothman as either a harbinger of doom or, more sinisterly, its cause, like an absol with wings, a legend that it has its roots in the tragedy that befell the Point Pleasant community shortly after the Mothman arrived. This right here, the Silver Bridge Collapse, <clears throat> constructed in 1928, connected Point Pleasant and Canauga, Ohio, name credited to the aluminum colored paint used. First eye bar suspension bridge of its type in the US. Rush hour collapse on 15th of December 1967, resulting in 31 vehicles falling into the river, killing 46 and injuring 15. Where did I get 15 from? December 9. Failed eye bar joint and weld identified as cause, resulted in congressional passage of national bridge inspection standards in 1968. Celebration, year 2000, West Virginia Division of Archives and History, 2006. On December the 15th, 1967, as we literally just read on this sign, just over a year after the first Mothman sighting, traffic was especially bad. Okay. The Silver Bridge, built in 1928 to connect Point Pleasant to Gal... Galip... Galipolis? Galapolis? Ohio. 
was packed with cars from end to end. It had been built at a time where cars were lighter. The Model T weighed just 1,500 pounds, a modest sum when compared to the 1967 average for a car. 4,000 pounds! Are they heavier now, or are they lighter now? Because if a car in 1967 was 4,000 pounds, and it didn't have a computer in it, and most cars have those now, they probably weigh more than that. We need to check our bridges, like, now. Anyway, its engineers hadn't been particularly imaginative when it came to the future. FUTURE! Nor, and nor had they been especially cautious. The bridge's design featured very little redundancy, meaning that if one part failed, there was almost nothing in place to prevent the other parts from failing as well. And on that cold December day, that was exactly what happened. Without warning, a single eye bar near the top of the bridge on the Ohio side cracked. The chain snapped and the bridge, its careful equilibrium disturbed, fell to pieces, plunging cars and pedestrians into the icy water of the Ohio River below. Forty-six died, drowned, or crushed in the wreckage. Oh, there's a video about it. I'm not going to click it so I don't get yelled at by ABC. It was the second terrible and bizarre thing to put the small community of Point Pleasant on the map in a year. And some connected the two. Naturally. In 1975, author John Keel conflated the Mothman sightings and the bridge disaster, as well as reported UFO activity to create his book, The Mothman Prophecies. His story took hold, and the town became an icon among conspiracy theorists, ufologists, and fans of the paranormal. Trending today, three ways your cat asks for help. Where's the Mothman today? It's probably not that guy. He doesn't even really have the ten-foot wings or whatever. Point Pleasant's fame as the home of the Mothman legend hasn't waned in recent years. In 2002, a movie based on Keel's book rekindled interest in the Mothman. In the Mothman Prophecies film, Richard Gere plays a reporter whose wife seems to have witnessed the Mothman shortly before her death. He finds himself inexplicably in Point Pleasant several years later with no idea how he got there, and he's not the only one in the area having trouble explaining himself. As it just advertises a few movies, and none of them are the Mothman Prophecies. You had one job, Amazon overlords. Several locals are experiencing premonitions of distant disasters, and there's talk of visitations from a mysterious figure called the Mothman. I'm not going to click that either, because same reason, I don't want to get yelled at by whoever uh, owns this movie. The film, a supernatural horror and mystery, offers no conclusions, communicating instead a he an eerie feeling of disjointedness that was both panned and praised by critics as they do. Most notably, the film popularized the image of the Mothman as a harbinger of DOOM! The idea that visitations from the Mothman predicted disaster led some believers to make ties to the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, the Mexican swine flu outbreak of 2009, and the 2000 nuclear disaster in Fukushima. What year did I say? 2011. Nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan, among others. I don't understand... <clears throat> How the Mothman of West Virginia would have had anything to do with Chernobyl in Russia, the Mexican swine flu, and Japan. But okay, sure, crazy people. The Mothman can still be seen in Point Pleasant, West Virginia today in the form of a historical museum open seven days a week and also as a 12 foot tall chrome polished statue. Complete with massive steel wings and ruby red eyes. Oh, it's a stack. It's a picture. What is it? Roadsideamerica.com. A festival commemorating the visits take place annually for years. A fun celebration that attracts locals and tourists alike. If you're passing through West Virginia this September, consider swinging on by the festivities to remember one of America's strangest and most intriguing local legends. This lady in this bikini sale. No, uh, Mothman. They also have, uh, after learning about the legendary Mothman, investigated the modern-day myth of Slenderman, and then the true story of Bloody Mary, the woman behind the mirror. I... Is Bloody Mary a cryptid? I never thought about it. But we were going to be reading about Slenderman next anyway, I just already had a couple of different pages pulled up for it. Because, again, I know nothing about Slenderman. I know he's got no face. I know he has a very good taste in tuxedos, I know he's in the woods, and he has a really crappy notebook. That's it. That is it. That's all I know. And that's probably all wrong. 
But I found two different kinds of articles about it. One of them is the Creepypasta Wiki, and the other one is directly referencing this whole thing. Yeah. Also, stop. Stop with that. So I guess I could click to see what they have to say about it, since it's not the creepypasta. W okay, no, never mind. It, it also just okay. How many years apart are these? Twenty sixteen, twenty fifteen. When did that happen? Um. Well, if both those articles are going to make us relive that, let's just start with the creepypasta wiki. Um. The Slender Man is an alleged paranormal figure purported to have been in existence for centuries, covering a large demo, demo no not demographic, if he covered a large demographic that'd be impressive, covering a large geographic area. Believers in the Slender Man tie his appearances in with many other legends around the world including Fear d b the Dark Man in Scotland, the Dutch Talking Man, the Branch Man, and the German legend of d Der Grobman? I'm pretty sure that's not a B. I'm pretty sure that's an S. Because, yeah, Derek Grossman. Because I know when people say Shiza, it's usually that letter. Um, the Tall Man. The appearance of the Slender Man. He's a, a being, male in appearance, who looks like a man with extremely long, slender arms and legs. He also appears to have four to eight long black tentacles that protrude from his back. Didn't know about that. Though different photographs and enthusiasts agree on this fact. And therefore it is theorized he can contract these tentacles at will. Or they disagree. He is described as wearing a black suit strikingly similar to the vestige of the notorious Men in Black. And as the name suggests, appears very thin and able to stretch his arms and torso to inhuman lengths in order to induce fear and ensnare his prey. Once his arms are outstretched, his victims are put into something of a hypnotized state where they are utterly helpless to stop themselves from walking into them. So, death hug, got it. Stretchy, faceless death hug man in the woods, got it. He's also able to create tendrils from his fingers and back that he uses to walk in, on in a similar fashion to Dr. Octopus. But why though? But why though? The superhuman stretching ability could also be seen as a similarity between himself and Mr. Fantastic. Why do y'all keep comparing him to Marvel people? Y'all wanna maybe not compare? All right. Um, whether he absorbs, kills, or merely takes his victims to an undisclosed location or dimension is also unknown, as there are never any bodies or evidence left behind in his wake to deduce a definite conclusion. Is he just the old man from the SCP wiki, but without a face? Did they come from the same pit? Is he the the pit? Did he make the old man? His face is pale and slightly ghostly, and almost appears to have been wrapped in a type of gauze or cloth. His facial features are also an object of debate, and many people believe that his face looks indifferent different to each person, if it's seen at all. He sometimes is portrayed wearing a hat, uh, which is something sometimes a bowler, a fedora, or sometimes a top hat. He may be also seen wearing a long flowing necktie or scarf, which is either red or gray. I feel like if... If, if this thing, I'm pointing at the picture, if that came at me in the woods, but it was wearing a top hat, I don't know if I'd be able to take the threat seriously. Or fedora? Can you imagine? Like, I don't mean like a milady fedora, I don't mean none of that nonsense. I mean like an Indiana Jones fedora. If I saw Slenderman walking at me in the woods, first off, I would not be in the woods looking for Slenderman, because I'm not... I can't say that, but... If he was coming at me wearing an Indiana Jones fedora, I would probably laugh if I was not already hypnotized by an impending doom. Um, he often keeps his long, pale hands crossed politely behind his back, or hanging loosely at his sides. I don't think it's politely in any way if his hands are behind his back, when he can make tentacles also come out of his back. So it's like, come give me a hug, brother! Um... His suit is black, sometimes portrayed as pinstripe in artwork, a common misconception thanks to a very similar Jack Skellington from Nightmare Before Christmas. The very similar, not a similar. Jack Skellington's not a cryptid. He might be. Depends on how you feel about it. He has long coattails, which he lets pr flow proudly. He wears long dress shoes, which are always shined a perfect gleaming black. 
Which is surprising, seeing as he just walks around in the woods. Need to find his shoe shiner. Behavior. Much of the fascination with Slenderman is rooted in the overall aura of mystery that he is wrapped in. Despite the fact that it is rumored he kills children almost exclusively, it is difficult to say whether or not his ob only objective is slaughter. Okay. Um, oftentimes it is either reported or recorded that he can be found in sections of woods, and these generally tend to be suburban. He's also been reported seen with large groups of children, as many photographs- Gollum, what are you doing here? Okay, there he goes. As many photographs portray. It is commonly thought that he resides in woods and forests and preys on children. He seems unconcerned with being exposed in the daylight or captured in photos. Does he wave? That would be hilarious. It is often thought as well that he enjoys stalking people who become overly paranoid about his existence, purposely giving them glimpses of himself in order to further frighten him. For this reason, it seems like Slenderman very much enjoys psychologically torturing his victims. See, that that what that says to me is the game may very well just be him chasing after the dude because the dude's like, Pfft, Slenderman, that's a bunch of baloney. But this piece of paper has a picture of him. And so does that one. Oh god, what was that in the trees? And Slenderman's just out in the distance going, <laughs> He's so stupid. That's how I choose to see that game now. From now on in my brain, the Slenderman video game is just him chasing after a dumb dude who was tricked into thinking he's real and he just finds it hilarious. He probably doesn't even kill you at the end. He just grabs you by your face like BOO and then hugs you and throws you to the ground and runs off giggling. That's what happens now. It is law. He also appears to float or drift around rather than walk, which suggests the possibility of him being an ethereal being rather than a creature or man. D did did y'all think tentacle backed McDockock legs was not ethereal? Did you really? This would also explain why he's able to remain mobile in spite of his poorly proportioned body. Y'all said he was a shapeshifter. It's only poorly proportioned if he wants it to be, and it's only poorly proportioned in comparison to you. To him, his proportions can be whatever the hell they want, and he can do as he damn well pleases. So there. Even though Slenderman was fabricated on something awful for him, some people have already claimed sightings. He's seen mostly at night, peering into open windows, and walks out in front of lone motorists on secluded roads. He's a deer. His main intentions appear to be kidnapping children. You've already said that. As he is, when he's seen near them in photographs, they usually disappear shortly afterwards. The Slender Man has also inspired many stories such as those of marble hornets. In the end though, his purpose remains unknown. An interesting take on Slender Man by a pasta member who is relying on the marble hornet series for evidence slash facts. <clears throat> there has been a big misconception about my pal the Slender Man due to the appearance of this article. He does not have hair or face. Everything else is correct. There's also some questioning as to whether or not there's more than one. I find that unlikely. It's most likely Slendy fucking with your head in order to make you think there's more than one. Which he's been known to do. As of now, Slendy has three or four known accomplices. There are Hoodie, Maskey, The Rake, and possibly The Observer. Not much is known yet because the next episode of the Noah Maxwell RARG has not yet been released. In the Marble Hornets ARG, Hoodie and Maskey are possibly his followers. In the Everyman Hybrids ARG, the Rake seems to be working with him, but we really aren't sure if that's true or not. I don't know what the Rake is either. I don't know if the Rake was on the list of recommended cryptids my friend gave me. But if he's watching these, then maybe it will be? But it might be, and I'm just dumb. Historical references. Brazilian cave paintings, Egyptian hieroglyphs, German woodcuts. Okay. Romanian mythology. There's also. Okay, well, this one's a fairy tale. Let's see. Maybe I'll just go by. Well, I'll, I'll look at the ones that seem to be storied. Renowned German woodcutter Hans Fleckenberg. Created at least two woodcuts featuring a character he described as Der Ritter, the knight, during the mid 16th century that were discovered in Halsberg Castle in 1883. 
while whilst Freckenberg was well known for his realistic depiction of human anatomy, something that was unusual among woodcuts of the time, these pictures featured a skeletal, multi-lived creature. Historians are unsure of the exact symbolic nature of the character, while with some claiming that it is a personification of the religious wars that raged in Europe at the time, while others say it represents the mysterious plagues that have been believed to be the reason for the mysterious abandoning of the Halsberg Castle and the nearby village in 1543. All of these theories are, of course, foolish, because as we English majors know, it merely means he likes drawing skeletons with several arms. You don't need to look into it that hard. It's just a, it's just a bony man with multiple limbs. That's it. Anyway, however, many insist that Freckenberg was attempting to represent Der Grossmann, the tall man. According to legend, he was a fairy who lived in the Black Forest. Bad children who crept into the woods at night would be relentlessly chased by Der Grossmann, who wouldn't leave them be until he either caught them or they were forced to tell their parents of their wrongdoing. Even then, there is a chilling account from an old journal dating back to about... from about 1702. My child, my Lars, he is gone, taken from his bed. The only thing that we found was a scrap of black clothing. It feels like cotton, but is softer, thicker. Lars came into my bedroom yesterday, screaming at the top of his lungs that the angel is outside. I asked him what he was talking about, and he told me some nonsense fairy story about Dirk Grossman. He went out into the groves by our village and found one of my cows dead, hanging from a tree. I thought nothing of it at first, but now he is gone. We must find Lars, and my family must leave before we are killed. I am sorry, my son. I should have listened. May God forgive me. I don't know if that's a lady or a guy, but it's too late now. Meanwhile, in Romanian fairy tales, the Tall Man, uh, featuring this description, which may have been t may have been taken to refer to the Slender Man, the Tall Man stood in a clearing, dressed as a nobleman, all in black. Shadows lay over him, dark as a cloudy midnight. He had many arms, all long and boneless as snakes, all sharp as swords, and they writhed like worms on nails. He did not speak, but made his intentions known. In the fairy tale, the tall man causes a mother to kill her husband and child before he slid it from a fireplace and clenched her in his burning embrace. That rhymes. In English mythology, there's a myth of referring to the tree man, whom is said to have a slim body with appendages that look like tree branches. He's only known to be seen in the woods and was used as a story that parents told their children to thwart bad behavior. There have been quite a few disappearances of children that have been said to have been linked to the tree man. Okay. Interesting. And... Oh, it was originally published in 2014. It's been republished because they... Okay. And, nope, nope, nope. We're, we're gonna... We're gonna not. But also, we're gonna cover the Chupacabra today because I don't really know about anything about the Chupacabra either. Pretty sure it eats goats. That's all I know. Um... Uh, let's check the BBC. Why not? The truth about a strange blood-sucking monster. A trail of bodies seemingly left behind by the vampire-like Chupacabra enabled one man to solve the mystery. I don't know what I thought it was going to look like when this picture loaded, but I was not expecting that little <laughs> mouth it got going on right there. So like somebody took a fish and a cat and slammed its face against the wall to make it look like Voldemort, and that's a Chupacabra. Everyone loves a good monster story. The problem is, monsters always insist on living in faraway lands, at the bottom of lakes, or in the depths of forests. While this adds to their mystique, should I be reading this in an accent because BBC, or is that not okay? I'm a not. It is little wonder that our knowledge of them comes exclusively from grainy photos and unreliable witness reports. I'm gonna drink some water real quick. This is what first drew Benjamin Radford to the Chupacabra, a supposedly vampire-like creature. Can you imagine if a vampire had a face like that Chupacabra picture? Like, you're just walking through a dark alleyway at night, and you just see some suave dude wearing a scarf over his face, and then he glamours you and you're all seduced, and then the last thing you hear before you wake up in your bed the next morning while the pain in your neck is... Uh, <clears throat> sorry. 
Its roots are in Latin America, but the stories about it have spread to the rest of the world, including his native New Mexico. This was much more local mystery to me, says Radford. I didn't have to go to Inver Inverness or Borneo. It was right here in my backyard. Over the chup chupacabra also seemed to be less shy than your, or helpfully, less shy than your average monster. I was thinking they was going to say hopefully not actually in your backyard because that would be bad. That meant Radford had a good chance of figuring out whether or not it was real. And Radford's extensive investigation of the mysterious chupacabra was five years long. Okay. Tales of the Chupacabra first emerged in Puerto Rico in the late 1990s. Really? Am I... I'm older than the concept of the Chupacabra? What? Get out of here. Man, I would have thought the Chupacabra was way older than that. What was going on in the, the late 1990s that people were like, You know, we need a goat-sucking vampire. Let's do it. Yeah. Anyway, they described a bipedal creature four or five feet tall with large eyes, spikes down its back, and long claws. This beast, people claimed, was responsible for killing and draining the blood of livestock. An act that earned it its name, which is Spanish for GOAT SUCKER. The Chupacabra. The GOAT SUCKER. I wonder which half is which. Is GOAT, chup is goat CHUPA or is GOAT CABRA? Because if sucker is chupa, that's funny. But if sucker is cabra, that's also funny. But either one of those being goat seems weird. In his extensive investigation, which took him a total of five years, and saw him travel as far as the jungles of Nicaragua, Nicaragua, I, I think I, I almost said Nargacuga. Uh, Radford even located the person who first reported the beast, Chupacabra Patient Zero. Her name is Madeline Tolatino, and she comes from the town of Conovanas, a town in the east of Puerto Rico. Can I possibly figure out how to say that? I don't know why I thought this was going to help. <clears throat> in 1995, she spotted a scary alien-like creature out of her window. What is remarkable is how fast the story traveled. After more reported sightings and links made subsequently in the media with livestock that had been found drained of blood, the legend of the Chupacabra spiraled out of control. First it spread around the island, then the rest of Latin America and into the southern U.S. states. It also flourished online, where it was latched onto by UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists. The Chupacabra was described as a hairless dog-like animal. That looks less... I don't know how that would go about sucking something dry. Except for maybe a bone. Then, in the early 2000s, a different chupacabra arrived on the scene. This one shared some of the traits of earlier sightings, but was a little less alien. This time it was described as a hairless, dog-like animal walking on four legs. And, unlike most monsters, this type was not based exclusively on sightings. Chupacabra bodies have reportedly been found. When Radford, a research fellow with the Committee of Skeptical Inquiry, got wind of the story, he recognized a unique opportunity. Between the dead livestock and the actual specimens, he had the makings of an unprecedented scientific investigation into a creature that had already achieved infamy on par with Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, in much less of the time. This was a story he could really get his teeth into. Did he say that, or did you say that? Because... If either of y'all actually phrased it like that, that is in very poor taste. When you have a body, everything changes, he explains. You have DNA samples, you have bone samples, you have morphology. As with all of his missions, Radford approached the Chupacabra with an open mind, and blood what he calls investigative skepticism, conducting field work, collecting evidence, and interviewing witnesses. I was, of course, initially skeptical of the creature's existence, he says. At the same time, I was mindful that new animals have yet to be discovered. I didn't want to just debunk or dismiss it. If the chupacabra is real, I wanted to find it. The most obvious place to start was with the chupacabra bodies. These have mostly turned up in Texas and uh, other southwestern U.S. states, and Radford has recorded about a dozen in total. They are quite horrific looking, hairless with gaunt appearance and burnt looking skin. However, DNA tests revealed a pretty mundane reality. The bodies have invariably turned out to be coyotes, dogs, or raccoons. 
Barring one that was actually a fish. Huh? What? But despite clear DNA evidence, this version of events is a little fishy. Haha. <laughs> The people who found and often shot these creatures were usually ranchers or rural folk who should recognize a coyote when they see one. So where does this confusion come from? The reason these animals get identified as chupacabras is because they've lost their hair owing to sarcoptic mange, explains Radford. Sarcoptic mange is caused by an itch-inducing mites called sar sarcoptic scabe, burrowing into the upper layer of the skin. It is very common. Allison Diesel of Texas A&M University, U.S., who specializes in inflammatory skin conditions in animals, agrees that this disease can be sufficiently gruesome to produce convincing monsters. The mangy dog is typically very sparsely haired to near bald, with red or hyperpigmented black thickened skin, she explains. Add to this the self-afflicted wounds from scratching and a hairless body and you have yourself a chupacabra. Scarpote's mites are thought to have infested humans for hundreds of years, thousands of years, but a more recent evolutionary history had made the transition to dogs and other similar animals. This could explain why scabies in humans, the minor rash that results from the mice burrowing into our skin, is a relatively trivial affair, whereas in dogs it can cause death. These animals might not have had long enough to evolve an effective immune response to the mites. But the chupacabras are only half the story. There are two sets of bodies here, says Radford. There are also the reports of dead livestock. Something is attacking these things, leaving puncture marks on the neck and supposedly draining their bodies of every drop of blood. So what's going on there? The answer, once again, is surprisingly straightforward. These animals are most likely the victims of ordinary predators, such as dogs or other canids. It is not uncommon for a dog to bite an animal on the neck and then leave it. Quite often, the animal will then die from internal hemorrhaging with no other injuries apart from puncture marks. And while, thanks to Dracula, puncture marks in the neck tend to be associated with vampires, Bill Shutt of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, the United States, says unequivocally that this is not how real-world blood-sucking creatures actually behave. Blood feeders are looking for blood that's close to the surface of the skin, something not found in the jugular vein, for example, he says. In fact, if we compare the characteristics of real blood-feeding animals such as vampire bats with those of the chupacabra, there are hardly any similarities. Vampires, according to Shutt, are small and stealthy with specialized teeth and digestive systems that allow them to exact nutrients from blood. A creature the size of a dog would starve to death pretty quickly on a blood meal, he says, owing to the lack of essential components such as fat. Besides the presence of these telltale bite marks, Radford thinks he might know why worried ranchers might attribute the death of their animals to a blood feeder. Having found a mysterious corpse, they would examine it and perhaps cut into it, expecting blood to spurt out, but they would be surprised. When an animal dies, the heart and blood pressure stop, he explains. The blood seeps to the lowest part of the body and it coagulates and thickens. It's called lividity, and it gives the illusion that they've been drained of blood. So if all the mythology surrounding the chupacabra actually comes down to some fairly commonplace natural phenomenon, why do these stories live on with such vehemence today? Bizarrely, Radford says it might have something to do with an anti-US sentiment found across Latin America. It's particularly true in Puerto Rico, which is the unusual is in the unusual position of being a non-state territory of the United States. I spoke to several Puerto Ricans who felt the US had exploited, shortchanged, and ignored the island in economic and many other ways, he says. Most recently, there was this resentment has played out in the island's ongoing debt crisis. As for chupacabras, there are many Puerto Ricans who believe they are another indication of American exploitation and meddling, the result of top-secret U.S. scientific experiments taking place in, in El Yunque rainforest, not far from Tolentino's hometown. This may be one factor, but the spread of such stories can largely be attributed to the internet. I would classify the Chupacabra as the first internet monster, said Bradford. If the first sighting had been in 1985, a couple of people would have heard of it, but it wouldn't have gone viral and spread across the world. Bradford points out that the myth has changed rapidly. The original Chupacabra had spikes on its back, big eyes, he says. Then over the years, the idea of what it was became bigger and bigger until you have any mangy dog being called a Chupacabra. Now go, people go on Google and search mysterious animal attacking things. It's self-perpetuating. What about those initial sightings? Having explained away the mysterious specimens and how they might operate, what does Radford think expired Tolentino to come up with such a story in the first place? The answer is unexpected. 
Radford noticed that Tolentino's 1995 subscription was similar to the alien from the 1995 movie Species, which had recently been released in Puerto Rico and which she had watched. The film was set in the present day, revolves around a top secret U.S. scientific experiments, and was partly filmed in Puerto Rico. It's all there! She sees the movie, then later she sees something she mistakes for a monster, says Radford. While he's careful to clarify that he's not think any witnesses are lying, he does just suggest that this sighting could simply be the result of an overactive imagination. Even today, while it is difficult to assess the extent to which people still believe the Chupacabra myth, it remains a widely discussed monster not only in Puerto Rico, but also the rest of the world. In recent years, Chupacabras have been reported as far afield as Russia and the Philippines. From my perspective, there is absolutely no reason to believe that anything out of the ordinary is involved in the attacks on livestock, says Radford. Instead, the whole story is a perfect storm of scientific misunderstanding, misidentification of animals, media hype, cultural anxiety, and mass hysteria, all potentially resulting from one woman's viewing of a film. It goes to show you can do all the rigorous analysis you want, all the investigation, all the science! At the end of the day, humans like stories and will continue to tell them, however pe peculiar or far-fetched. Okie dokie. So that about does it for this episode of whatever I'm calling this. Let's read about cryptids. And the next episode, I'll try to read about three more. If you liked it, a like and a subscribe will be groovy. If you didn't, you don't need to do either one of those things. If you'd like to click the bell, you can do that as well, because then you'll get notified of when the next one of these comes out. And I'll see you all in the next one. Later.